Just a timestamp this before I start. Um, India is currently going through a horrible, horrible crisis. India registers a record-breaking number of new coronavirus cases for a fifth day in a row. Chandra Bora is in mourning after the death of his son, Pulmon. Desperate people gasping for air, for oxygen that the hospitals can't provide. Well, the latest data has come in from the health ministry on COVID numbers and 2.22 lakh new cases were detected. And I was recently asked on a podcast, where is the one place that I would want to return to whenever we can go back to international travel? And the first place that came up was, in fact, India. to liken India to anything, it's this never-ending staircase going in both directions. And I got this feeling after only having spent two weeks within the country. The people, the culture, the spiritualism, the nooks and crannies of the towns that we were in, everything felt endless. Okay, so before I start speaking about how exactly I got to India, we're gonna have to rush through some early points. I predominantly work on documentary films, and many of my favorite projects have been focused on aid in developing countries. And it had been a dream of mine to work on something focused on medical assistance for a very long time. So I stumbled across an organization focused specifically on providing free medical camps in the state of Gujarat with the aim of helping people, especially with cataract operations and helping them with blindness. And so I reached out in 2018. Good morning. Yeah. Now, for somebody like me who uses their eyes for pretty much everything to do with my career and my job, imagining what it would be like to film a project about people suffering from blindness was both extremely exciting from a storytelling perspective, but also very, very daunting in terms of how I would be able to actually tell this story properly. But even before I arrived to India, there was another story that unfolded that was crucial to the way that I experienced the country when I first landed. And this is an excerpt from an audio file that I sent to one of the heads of the organization that I was going to work with. The reason I was meaning to call you is because last night I was at a, um an award ceremony here in Bulgaria where I was nominated and I, um, I left the award ceremony and my car was broken into and uh, uh, a lot of my equipment has been stolen and um, more importantly what I was calling about today was that my passport had been stolen uh, in which I had my Indian visa. And so I had less than 48 hours to get a new passport, to get a new visa, to find equipment for my travel, and to actually board my plane on time. But landing in India during the chaos of holy celebrations with fireworks and noises and music was actually one of the most calm periods I felt during those two weeks leading up to my travel. Now, I knew that there were ultimately four stories that I wanted to tell during my travel to India. One being the work of the organization itself and the project they had undertaken. Two being the story of the doctors who devoted their time to creating free traveling medical camps within the country. Three, being that of the patients who had undergone cataract surgery and had their sight restored. And four, the almost impossible to tell story of what exactly it feels like to be in India. <laughs> Okay. 
But India was also my first opportunity to experiment and to try to tell the story of an organization working from the country from a cinematic standpoint. Moving on to the things that I learned over my time in India, um, number one, I reaffirmed but also learned in many ways that daily life is everything. This will probably be obvious to everyone, but I still hope that it resonates with somebody new, and that's that daily life is crucial when telling the story of a new country. What I'm trying to say with this is that the everyday moments of a person, from the early morning waking up, to the lunchtime with the family, to going to sleep in the evening, is what shapes our understanding of a person. At least in my opinion. How can you have an understanding of someone or something if you don't see the similarities between your life and theirs? Yes, of course, there are fundamental differences, but there are also crucial similarities. The feeling of home. The purposeful morning rituals that take place. The time spent with family. The time spent alone. The time spent worrying. The time spent being excited. And in that sense, and I've said this before in other videos, but the most crucial thing that you can do when telling the story of an organization is to tell the story of the people that they actually helped. In that sense, India reaffirmed this feeling for me that I have an obsession with just finding some way to convince people that their life is interesting and beautiful and colorful. I think there's nothing more incredible than stumbling across someone surrounded by so much beauty that doesn't think much of their life because it feels monotonous to them or because they come from a village. Those are the stories worth telling, not those of people living in big cities that have already convinced themselves that their lives are interesting. And the best place to start telling those stories is by showing respect to somebody when it comes to the intricacies of their daily life. Two, balance the weight of storytelling. There's this question that often comes to mind for me whenever I'm filming in a developing country or in an impoverished neighborhood, and that's whether I'm creating too much of a drama out of something that doesn't need to be so. In this case, heading to India, I wanted to be very careful of the way in which I portrayed the country and its people. And for the most part, I think I succeeded in using music and footage that didn't just focus on the difficulties found within the country and within the medical field, but also on the empowered individuals given the ability to go and change their situation and have a better life. This was perhaps most apparent during the actual medical camp itself. The lineups of people from all of the nearby villages waiting for medicine, eye tests and general consultation, the doctors talking about the gratefulness they have to be part of these camps and to be able to help out their community. These were the things that I felt were the most crucial to showcase and to get across as the main message of the film. If you go out in the streets here, or you go a little bit further away and go into the outskirts, or you go into you know, the remote villages, you just see all these people, and they're real, and they exist. And the distance is very small. It just takes a few people from here to go out to them and make that difference. And, and that's why I think that to not leave these people where they are at, by, fend for themselves, but just actually go out and help them. It involves people who may not be able to read and write, yet they are part of the work that we do here. Um, all age groups. I saw a young seven-year-old girl come to the camp all by herself and met the doctor, told her ailment, and she went away with a little packet of medicine, very happy. And then we have the elderly, we had a gentleman once who was 100 years old who came and they walk away feeling they're carrying something else. They come with certain baggage, with certain emotion, and they walk away a different person. That's what I see. However, understandably so, there were moments during filming when I was perhaps too affected by what was going on and I found it difficult to decide on how I wanted to properly tell the story. One such moment definitely happened during one of the evenings when we were in a tribal village handing out supplies. And I don't have footage of the moment itself, but I do have footage of everything leading up to what happened. At one point, when it had become pitch black outside, an elderly couple approached the camp to ask for supplies. They took what they could and headed out into the pitch black night, and it was only when they headed back that I noticed that the man was in fact entirely blind and leaned on his wife the entire way back the dirt road which was maybe 30 centimeters away from the busy road with the cars rushing past and kicking up more dust. 
And it was at this moment that I think for the first time I realized what it actually means to be blind, especially in a smaller part of India and in the village areas and how if you don't have someone to rely on for absolutely everything, it doesn't seem like you can get much done with your day. And watching the two of them walk back into the darkness, I had to remind myself at this moment that this wasn't supposed to be a tragic story. This was supposed to be a story of hope and of beauty and of people being able to get themselves out of situations like that. In that sense, there's a fine balance in creating a film like this between not exaggerating the role of the international organization too much, but also not skipping its importance, showcasing the doctors in the region, but not placing them far above everyone else, finding a way to allow for patients that had undergone operations to tell their own stories, but also not skipping over the unimaginable difficulties that come with blindness in India. Number three, I realized that documentary work is about adaptability. Now, this might be a point that's more so focused on the technical aspects of how to film, but for a very large portion of my career, when I had started working with international organizations and large commercial clients, I was very, very, very nervous about the type of equipment that I used. For some reason, during the first years of filmmaking, the idea of not using a tripod, a slider, a stabilizer, of filming anything handheld was a distant thought for me because I was scared that the moment that the client saw any sort of shaky footage, this would immediately equate to unprofessionalism. And in the case of this project, this was the last time that I used such a large swath of equipment and decided to entirely go handheld because I realized that the only thing so much equipment was doing was distracting me from moments that I was missing on a daily basis. And so there were two moments in the film where I left all of my equipment behind and took just my camera because I realized I really was going to miss an important shot. One was when I ran after the mayor of a small town to capture his reaction to the medical camp that was being prepared. And then I left my slider and tripod and just sort of ran after him down the corner of the school. The other shot was of one of the first patients that we actually documented coming out of their field and heading back to their house. Both of these shots are nothing groundbreaking, but they were moments of realization that I was going to miss something that connected another part of the story together. And in that sense, India helped me realize that the most important part in any form of documentary work is inevitably the final shot. It doesn't matter if you don't have your equipment perfectly set up, it doesn't matter if you don't have the right lighting or if your audio isn't perfect. As long as you have the footage that you need, there will always be some way to work with it in post-production. And the final point that I want to focus on is one that's maybe a bit more complex, and that's the idea of finding the right stories to tell for you. Now, I think with most creative work, there's always a moment that's reached where someone asks themselves whether the types of things they are filming are devaluing the entire creative process for them. Whether too much time is spent on trying to find a way to sell a product, or convince someone that a service is important, or trying to change the image of a company. I was asking myself very much so whether I was spending too much of my creativity on these type of projects before I went to India, and the answer revealed itself very quickly on the way. That the real projects that matter, at least for me, are the ones that are very small, but ones that are extremely personal. It's not about trying to solve world hunger metaphorically, or trying to tell a very politically charged story. It's about finding a medical camp in Western India that is helping hundreds of people every time it's set up. And in that sense, ever since my time in India, I was reminded of how much I need these type of projects in my life. And especially when I reach a point of burnout with commercial work or anything that's unsatisfying, I think about these causes and how they really are everywhere around us. And I think all of this came to a culmination. Um, as with every project, there's always a point where you suddenly have this grand realization. When I was in the back of a truck heading out through the villages with the mayor of the town to announce that the medical camp was happening the next day. And finally, two, three days before, we also go to that area to announce that the camp, medical camp is coming. Please, if you need um, medical facilities, please come and check up there. So that day when we were on the back of the truck announcing the medical camp, just the evening before with the mayor and some boys from the local villages and it was a very humbling experience. I remember just trying to process everything the large groups of mothers and fathers, but most importantly, children rushing out into the streets to see what was going on. 
and there I was, sitting next to two giant speakers with something like a DJ on my right blasting local pop music in order to help get everyone's attention in the area. And I'm standing there and just thinking about how this moment, uh, this one right here, is the reason I wanted to get into documentary content to begin with. Because of people like this man, who uses everything they have as a means to get across to their people that something important is going to happen that will better their lives. And it's not done through emails or flyers or text messages, it's done through two very large, <laughs> very loud speakers and a truck going from village to village. I guess what I'm trying to say with this whole point is that creativity is a gift and not everybody has the luxury of feeling like they need or want to tell the story of other people around them. As such, I think it's normal that there will always be this endless questioning of how, why, and if stories around us are really that important that you should sit down and take the time to get to know them. In my case, India yet again confirmed for me this notion that the most powerful stories that we have around us are those told by people that believe they will never ever have a forum to get their story out about their passions, about their struggles, or about the beauty of waking up early in the morning and heading out into their banana field. And there are hundreds of stories like this around us every day. Find the ones that are most important for you. God has given me more than what I need. And I always felt that I should give back to community. See, mine is a pri private hospital where we everything is chargeable. But poor patient who cannot afford, for them at least I am doing little contribution to the society. And I always felt, even I tell my staff, ki if we were in their place, how we will feel. Unless you've actually been blind yourself, you would never know it. You just couldn't, you can't even imagine it in, in your wildest dreams, what it is like not to be able to see the food you're going to eat, not be able to walk to the bathroom or anything like that, to be able to put your clothes on, not to be able to wash. It's the one thing, one sense, the eyes, one sense that actually literally jeopardizes. Do you take the eyes away of a person? Wow. Within a matter of months, self-worth, self-esteem, everything goes out the window and you lose the dignity no matter, as a father and a mother, to lose the dignity and respect from your children and grandchildren and from your community is terrible. So there's this amazing thing, just beautiful thing that came in, um, that it brought more than just eyes back. It brought back laughter, joy, fun, culture, self-esteem, what we call dharma in, in, in India, uh, a sense of respect and a wholeness to a community because the family got stronger and a stronger family then affects the community. If the community gets stronger, it will affect the whole region. And of course, then eventually, hopefully the ripples will go out into a nation, national level and maybe even international level, who knows? So I thought this is a wonderful gift. We've done something like we've, we've seen about like nearly about 30,000 people. That has become probably the greatest mover and the shaker for us as a contribution from the world peace flame to the state of Gujarat and beyond.